This is the Bears Barroom Radio Network, and the following program is brought to you by the Vidoliak Law Group, fighting insurance companies since 1963, and TickSplits.com. TickSplits.com, no service fees. The price you see is the price you pay. This is the Bears Barroom Radio Network. The following program is recorded live and intended for all audiences. Radio is scripted now. We just come up with it. We don't use computers. We don't rehearse. We're going to talk about the snacks. We're going to talk about them. We're going to talk about the bulls. And then we're going to have Brad Big Son. And then we're going to have uh, all this. No. No. If you don't know what you're going to talk about in the top of your head before a show, you shouldn't be in the business. I don't know what you got. I feel like Vince Vaughn in, in a couple's retreat. The sharks are circling. Old school, baby. You're listening to the Mike North Advantage, and it begins right now. That's right. The Mike North Advantage starts right now. I am Aldo Gandia, Mike's wingman, and we have another very special show for you because we have another very special guest for you. He is Chris Zorge, the former defensive lineman over at Notre Dame and with the Chicago Bears, and he is now the AD over at Chicago State University. Chris Zorge joins us briefly. We're also going to talk about those Chicago Blackhawks now making a late season run for the playoffs. How about that? We're going to talk about that signing of Kareem Hunt to the Cleveland Browns. Mike expressed his disappointment because he wanted him for the Bears. We'll talk further about that. But right now, it is time to bring in the star of the show, Mike North. How are you, my friend? Good, Aldo. Thanks very much. And I'll tell you what, I'm looking forward to this show. I mean, we got so much uh, last week, so much reaction from the Jimbo Colbert interview. I said, you know what? Chicago Bears are gold. And before I bring this guy on, I just want to say that, you know what? Uh, He's one of my very, very dear friends. And I wrote this about him in uh, 2013 in the Daily Herald uh, after he went through some difficulty, just like I've been through difficulty. Anybody that's done something in their life has gone through difficulty and overcome it. And this is what I wrote about him. I consider Chris a friend, and I still consider him one of the most remarkably unselfish and charitable athletes I've ever met. He was really just one of us, but also a young man who basically willed himself to become a viable member of the National Football League through hard work. Now, there's no doubt something went wrong, but I will say this. No athlete I've ever seen in this town has done more for families in need or a person in trouble than Zorge. Chris was always there whenever I asked. I remember racing him 100 yards down a side street <laughs> near the radio station. But I told him I could beat him in a race. He won. He also did some charity work helping me with the yearly bowl of ramas we planned, at which we were the first of our kind. Now everybody does these bowl of ramas. When we needed him, he was always there. My wife, Bibi, and I, we gave plenty to charities over the years, and honestly, writing a check was easy for me. And I didn't. it didn't require a lot of effort. But Chris convinced me back in the 90s to help him deliver turkeys on Thanksgiving. I'll never forget the look of the faces on the people and the father who stared at me while just sitting on the couch because he was too ashamed to greet me. These are things that only I could have learned through Chris. During his prime, when most athletes cared only about themselves, he was ringing a bell for the Salvation Army. I haven't talked to Chris for a while, but I plan on it. What's up, my friend? And oh I'm my gosh, man, you, you are going to bring in tears again. When I read the article, I was in tears. Man. Well, Who I got to tell you, I got to tell you, I've always considered you, and, you know, they're making, uh, i got a lot of things going on right now as far as a movie and about uh, and my autobiography. And, and, you know, when I think of athletes, you know, they always bring up the argument with Ozzie Gian. They always bring up this. They always bring up that, uh, you know, stuff that I had with the athletes' confrontations. They never bring up the... Great relationships I had with guys like Jeremy Roenick or Jimmy Harbaugh or, of course, you. You made me do stuff I didn't think I was even going to do, Chris, and uh, <laughs> I think that's got to be told. And now look at you. You're an administrator, for God's sake, right? Who knew, man? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Let me ask I'll tell you what, man. I'll tell you what. I remember 91, my first year with the Bears. And you guys started this show on something called The Score a thousand years ago. Yeah. And 
I remember being a guest on your show all the time, and one of the things that made it so remarkable was that, I mean, you were telling it like it is. I mean, no one at that point had ever talked about a coach or questioned a coach, questioned the player's motives. And you were just, you, you and Dan Ziggis were the guys who were just regular people. And I think for, for Chicago and Chicago Sports Radio, I mean, you guys really started it. And, you know, the, the idea that you gave a voice to the guy down in the street was extremely important. And so, although at the time you dogged me for being short, you know, I mean, I, I had a pretty good stride and, 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 and I was able to kind of learn your interesting humor. And we, at that point, we became friends. You know what's funny? You took everything in stride, and a lot of the guys did, and a lot of the guys didn't. Not, you know, that station was an acquired taste, but I thought the thing I loved about you is, first of all, you're a Chicago guy. You, you, you're a street guy. You grew, you know, I've always said you're my favorite Croatian football player of all time. <laughs> we only won, right? <laughs> right. I just, I don't know, I never bothered. I met you, and I said, uh, I'll never forget when you gave me the turkeys. We got, we met over there with, uh, with the big truck and everything, and, yeah. uh, you said, Mike, you're going to Inglewood or you somewhere. And I had a convertible, a Mustang. And just the ride with, with B through the, through the neighborhoods of the South Side with the turkeys in the back seat and people just staring because I had the convertible down for some weird reason. But I, you know, it was, it was priceless. And then when I got to that house, I said, you've been through this a million times, Chris, and maybe it happened to even you. It was tough for the family, and I got I to gotta tell you something. Since that whole thing has ended, I don't know if there's been something to take its place. You know, I'm sure there's other charities and stuff, but I just think that having an athlete at the forefront at that time, you were a front runner. I mean, you were, for, you were a guy, a pioneer, if you know. Uh, how hard was it at the beginning? Oh my gosh! You kidding me? I mean, I had no idea what I was doing, you know. And, and I, it's 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 interesting that you you talk about the story because I remember um, talking to you after that, and you're kind of explaining. And I'm kind of grinning, nodding my head, because that experience was uh, had by a lot of the people who participated, and it wasn't. Now we could have had. Folks come to where we were at Soldier Field. We could have had a line. We could have had, okay, a box. Hey, here's a trick bubble. But a lot of folks that we helped wouldn't have been able to afford to come down to Soldier Field, right? I mean, those folks didn't have cars. Those folks didn't have transportation, unfortunately, like myself. And so as a kid growing up, you know, I kind of knew those circumstances. And so that's why I wanted to do this on the Tuesday that we had off from practice. We had everybody meet at Soldier Field, and we, that was way before Google and all this other stuff. We actually had to do the directions on a map, so it was crazy. But the idea that we were able to kind of have our folks go out into the community and, and help people was huge because that stemmed other things. I mean, I remember uh, Kirk Granderson from UIC. Right, I mean, yeah. he's a, this great baseball player. I read an article about how he like he got involved in helping people because he talked about when he was in college, their baseball team would come over and assist our foundation pass our turkeys, and so you know it's those things. And now look what he's done in history. Look what he's done yeah. for baseball. You know yeah. the, the idea that that yeah, we're, that I was a catalyst. Mm -hmm. Right, right, exactly, exactly. You know, and the idea that you can, you know, it's kind of like waves, right? Like you, you do one thing, you're not sure what effect that's going to have, but it has these, these ripple effects. And so the next time you may see somebody or the next time you may read an article or the next time you want to do something, you may have a better appreciation for what someone has to go through because that man sitting on, in a seat was so thankful, but it was hard for him to kind of approach you and say, well, thank you, because he couldn't provide for his no. family. So, I mean, it was that's very tough, tough, right? It was, it was tough, Chris. I'll say that. We're with uh, my buddy Chris Zorch, and, you know, I, I thought that, you know, that was one of a kind, just like the Bolarama we did. We were the first to ever do it. 
for four <laughs> years we did it. Well, we had athletes of all kinds, Evander Holyfield, uh, uh, you know, you, you name, we had the top flight guys, uh, uh, Jerome Bettis. Uh, we brought in all the Blackhawks, Bob Probert. Uh, we were the first, and what we would do is we'd have the athletes move down after each game. Because like golf outings, you'll get to go off with one celebrity, and that's the whole 18. Here, people got the bowl with three different types. and Yeah, it was, that, that was awesome. It wasn't a good, and, and you know what? We were the first. Now, Kerry Woods got one. A bunch of people got them. Everybody does a bowl of rama. The bowls do a, a charity thing. But Chris and I and Jeff Schwartz were the first to really start it, and we'd fly in <laughs> like people from all over, and Chris and I didn't really have a clue. Chris, I was just praying Chris would finally get there because, you know, the obligations <laughs> and stuff like that. But it was stuff like that that when it came to doing charity stuff, it was with you, and because um, I felt it was genuine, and I thought, and, and I, I'm not going to lie, I, I, we ended up becoming buddies because I'll never forget the one time you really got hot. We didn't get hot. You never, you just got, hey, you know, you come back at me, which was good. You, I, I said that I thought there was a 97 yard line on the field, and you go, well, what do you mean? And I said because you're on your ass. And you're back the whole time, and it indented in the field between the 40 and the 50. You didn't, you didn't like that much, and then it escalated into the fact that I thought I could beat you in a race. <laughs> and you said, listen, pal, I'm a National Football League player. I didn't get here by accident. I'll do the race. We promoted it for a month. We went it was like seven to, on a side street and on the north side. There was what eight hundred people there. Oh, it was awesome! And you blew me away. And we're laughing. I put it out on Twitter now. If people want to go to north to north, we're laughing. We're halfway there because I was dead, and I had won street races. My whole life as a kid, people used to race each other for money. I, I raced you. You got off that line. I knew what made you great. I knew what made you <laughs> play in the NFL. It was the first three steps. You showed me that day, didn't you? I tried. I tried. And, and, and the thing that was great about it was that, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was fun. And, you know, again, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you're able to back it up. You know, you said, oh, Chris, come on, you're slow, you're doing whatever. You know, you said, hey, you, let's go race. And we did. I mean, I think those things obviously aren't happening these days. But, no. you know, when you talk about the interaction with the media and the players near Chicago, you know, they're, they're obviously you're really Chicago good. You're a Chicago Bear defensive tackle, a pro bowler racing me down the street. Yeah, but I grew up in Chicago, team. so those races yeah. you talked about as a kid, right. we used to do them with no shoes. All the time. All the time. They're very time. That was like the best thing you could do in the neighborhood. That's right. Who was the fastest? Who could do this? I just saw what you could do. I got I to gotta tell you, Chris, because we only got 20, 25 minutes. Um, you know, when it comes to what you're doing now, and you see where Chicago State's got to go. And I've looked at the history. I mean, your last All-Americans. I mean, Chicago State used to have a ton of All-Americans, whether it was swimming, volleyball, whatever you name it. What has that taught you? And, 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 and where would you put between 1 and 10 where Chicago State has to go athletically? Okay. Oh, I mean, where, where, there's where no... Where are you at right now? There's absolutely no question that, you know, we obviously need to improve. You know, last year our women's team won one game. They actually broke a, a two, two, two year losing streak last year with winning one game. Um, on our men's side, I think we actually won three games and two of those were against, uh, Division Two opponents. So the idea that we need improvement is there. And so my philosophy is that, look, you know, we are going to be in, in a transition year. We need to have people that understand coaching, but more importantly, understand the game of life. And so I could, I, I, Mike, I can't tell you on the men's side how many phone calls I got, how many phone calls from agents I got, how many phone calls from personal players, from, from current and former NBA coaches, from current and former other Division I basketball teams. I mean, this job, and I kind of joked about it at the time, but there are 351 Division One basketball teams. 
at that time, it was ourselves and um, Detroit Mercy. We were the only two people that didn't have a coach at that point. And I'm sure they got phone calls just as we got. But the idea that somebody wants to be a Division One coach was extremely important to a lot of people. So I had, I had a pick of 100 people. I had a pick of former pro coaches. I had a, a pick of former great college coaches. But what I was looking for was someone that understood Chicago, one, but two, faced some adversity in life because anybody could coach the, the game of basketball. I want you to be able to, to coach the game of right. life. I want now, someone who these young men and young women are going to talk to 40, 50 years later. I want someone who's willing to teach them about the And we are able to find someone in Lance Irvin on the men's side and Missy Opat on the women's side. Now, let me ask you this, Chris. When you see that the demographics and where the school's located, okay, 70% African-American enrollment, uh, which to me doesn't matter. I, I went to Truman College in Uptown. Uh, in fact, I love that experience. But for some people, whatever, either way, it could be something that's hard. Or the fact that the sports program was neglected for so long. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you, I'm sure we could come up for five, six, seven reasons why it didn't work out. But what good would that do now? Are you basically treating this like uh, an expansion Team, your first, your second year in existence, instead of uh, uh, looking back in the past, as as uh, you you will look at when you look up the All Americans and stuff like that. Right, you know, you, you're absolutely right. And what we sell our student athletes on when we are going through the recruiting process is what we have to offer. We we have to offer. We have a new president in Z Scott. We have new board members. We have a new foundation. We have new coaches. We have a new athletic director. I mean, what's happened in the past was terrible. Now, we, as a new unit, have to move forward from that. And I'm selling our student athletes and the, the coaches that we're hiring on what can you do in the future? What can you do to make us great? Because we, we are going to be great. There's no doubt. We have tremendous talent in all sports in Chicago. Sure. We want to make Chicago a viable place and we want to win those recruit, recruiting battles against UIC, against DePaul. Is it going to be tough? Absolutely, yes. But I've never backed away from the challenge. I want to find coaches. I want to find players who, if you're down by 10 points, you don't think the game's over. I mean, the idea and understanding what adversity is. Adversity is not uh, something that you know you're, you're going to overcome. Adversity is not knowing. But forging ahead, working hard, making sure that you know what you can do. And so I kind of joke around and say, you know, hey, I've been through a lot. And I have. But at the end of the day, it's maybe the person I am. And so when I'm sitting across the street from the parents of a young man or young woman who is being recruited by Chicago State, I tell them the truth. I tell them why I'm there. I tell them that I grew up in Chicago. I'm honored to be here. I can be a lot of places, but I chose to come here because I think this is something, something special. And so, you know, in the last couple of, so I've been there for nine months since I've been talking to recruits. Um, and we kind of joke around and call me the closer because I can come in there and I can talk oh, to parents about academics. Now the closer? Is that your name? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got it on your business card? Christopher I wish. Huh? I wish. I wish. But, but, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm yeah. selling sure. the parents on what I've done. I'm selling the parents on the type of individual I was. And I'll tell them flat out, you know, hey, I've had some good days and I've had some bad days, but I'm here now and I'm here to make sure your daughter or your son is going to be successful at our school. Let me ask you this. How important is it since you grew up on the South Side? The, the, where Keena Turner and Dick Butkus, you went, Roseland, uh, I mean, if you know the city folks, uh, you, don't, you can't pretend with Chris or I. We know every bit of the city. So how important is it that you were, number one, from uh, that area? You went to CVS, uh, famous school, great school back in the day, especially for football with Bernie O'Brien, uh, and, and you were a bear. How more accessible has that been, for instance, or as if you were maybe something else, an administrator with just a good college background? 
Oh, I, I mean, actually, the, the reason why I got the job, I was hired by our last president, and the reason why I got the job, and she thought something, me, she said, look, you are sitting at, a sitting athletic director currently, but you also know Chicago. You were born and raised in Chicago. So having a chance with your pedigree, I mean, how could I not hire you? Because when you look at born and raised in Chicago, you know, went to college 90 miles away, came back, faced the beloved Bears, Went back to law school at Notre Dame, came back here and worked. I, I worked at a, a community college, Prairie State College, that I saw every day for three years when I drove to Prairie State College in Chicago Heights. I drove past Chicago State every day, hmm. there and back for three years. Every day in the back of my mind, I said, someday, someday, someday. Guess what? I'm there. So you thought so, this was coming. You felt that I there knew was, it was coming. opportunity here. Well, that's cool. Now, now. I got to ask you about your other college, okay? Because once again, they laid an egg at the end, but at least they got there. <laughs> Are you happy? No, seriously, I love, I like Brian Kelly. I, I just, I don't remember his offenses being this stagnant at times when he was at Cincinnati. Now, I know it was a whole different ball game over there, but at least he gets them to the Final Four because I can remember the days you and I would talk you know, about uh, uh, when Lou Holtz was coach and how the, he had to try to change the standards and everything else. And, and we thought if at the time people were saying, well, you know, the athletes don't want to go to Notre Dame anymore. They want to go to Florida State, Florida, Miami, where it's hot. Well, guess what? They've all fizzled out. Uh, what's your impression of the program? Uh, do you think that they're going to be perennially a playoff team? Because they do play a tough schedule. Uh, and do you think that uh, Kelly's there for the long haul? Well, I do think Kelly is there for the long haul, and I, I think it's great that we finally had a chance to actually be part of the college football playoff system because for so long, people talk about, oh, what about Notre Dame, what about Notre Dame, what about Notre Dame? Not in the conference, not in the conference. What can they do? Well, we showed them that we at least belong. Now we have to show them that we can beat these teams, and I think that was a huge difference, and, and you, you have to make these steps. I mean, you can't just sit there and say, oh, hey, we belong in that game. The best thing that could have happened, and this is not crazy, the best thing that, that, thing that could have happened to Notre Dame was them getting blown out by Clemson. Because now they know the standard in which they have to play. So I guarantee you, Coach Kelly and his coaching staff went back to their war room and talked about speed. They talked about getting more players from the South. They, they talked about getting players that understand not only – how to win, but, but also how to be successful academically. And you can find it. I mean, you talk about during the time that we were there, we won a national championship, and we graduated all of our guys. So right. the idea that it can't be done, I know it can be done. Believe me, it's a struggle. Now, you have to start assigning some tutors to people, but at the end of the day, you are going to get it done, and that's what's most important. Now, you know what's funny, Chris, is I coached at Notre Dame of Niles College Prep for six years, and we won 20 games yearly with Tom Les as the head coach there, and I was one of his assistants. But I recruited this one kid uh, that uh, he was about six foot six, but he was, and he was from Bosnia, and he was a, but he was a Muslim. And the religious aspect came into play. We almost got him anyway because we took any denomination. The mother was fearful that he'd have to go to religion, to Catholic religious classes. We assured her that he didn't, but she ended up going in another direction. I didn't blame her. I wanted to ask you about the religious aspect of Notre Dame and if that does turn off some kids, or if it did. Well... We had, and, and that was my first impression too. I mean, I, you know, I'm not Catholic, but when, when we were there, we had the idea, we were under the impression that, hey, you know, we're going to have to go to Mass every day, although people said we didn't have to, we mm -hmm. didn't, did not have to do that. Did we have to take a religious course for first year? Yes, you did. But other than that, they assisted individuals if they wanted to go to different denomination churches they would have a bus that would actually take you to those places. What's interesting is people talk about that, and coach talk about this all the time. We have Rocket Ishmael, who's Muslim. Right. Right. Up on the Heisman Trophy. One of the best Very players in college athletics. Yeah. At Notre Dame. Muslim. So the idea that we are not all encompassing is a fallacy, 
but more important is they will support well, whatever religion you are, they will support that at the end of the day, it's a faith-based school. Sure. You don't have to be Catholic in order to be successful there. You don't have to be Christian to be successful there. It's just it's a faith-based institution that will allow you to practice your faith, and if you don't have transportation, it will also get you to those places off campus. Man, I got to tell you, you sound a lot sharper than you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm I'm stunned here. I could just tell being back at school. I'm the executive now. now, man. I'm the director. Well, I, I got to be able to put a phrase that... together now. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I got to tell you too, Chris, is that um, the Chicago Bears. I think you would have had a blast playing on this team. I don't know if oh my you know, god, oh. I mean, uh, because you played under. The worst of times, the worst circumstances, <laughs> right after you had Ditka and then you went to Wanstead, which was like going from Gibson's uh, to, you know, somebody's picnic in, in zero weather. Uh, how? But, but really, first your impressions of this year's team. First of all, I, I am so excited to be a Bear fan. I mean, the idea, especially on the defensive side, right? Because the idea that we have guys who are not only game changers, they're actually big play makers. I mean, yep. thinking that on defense, I didn't think it happened. When was the last time we actually thought about that? I mean, even when Brian Urlacher was playing, we didn't have enough Brian Urlachers on that team where we knew that something was going to happen. Every play, there's a possibility we could either score, we could get an interception, we could get a second right. return. I mean, now, again, as a, as a faithful Bear fan, when Coach Nagy didn't play starters for the last preseason game. I thought it was nuts as did everybody else did. <laughs> everybody was crazy. Yeah. Guess what? Well, you know what's funny? It worked out. There's no doubt. But, you know, it, I, you got to hope it happens again. I think people want to see it and think it will happen again. I definitely think it will happen again. I think that Khalil Mack tipped anything over. I mean, tipped the whole thing over, changed the whole division. Just adding one player of that pedigree. I mean, I think he's the best linebacker that they, the Bears have had for the last 20 years. I'm sorry, Brian Urlacher. I'm sorry, Lance Briggs. I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth. What kind of acquisition does that do for the rest of the team, especially a defense? Well, you saw it, right? I mean, as soon as he yeah. walks in, the, the level of competition – rose tremendously. I mean, I, again, being a better fan, being in the league, being an administrator, understanding, I was like, oh my God, they just gave away the farm for one person. That's crazy. Guess what? That first game, <laughs> within like yeah. five minutes, he, he, I think he either caused a fumble straight. He, he did like for two amazing plays in a row. I was like, oh, well, that's the reason why he's worth it. I mean, the idea that you have one person who's enough of a playmaker to inspire and get other folks on the same side of the ball excited. And then now, and I guarantee you, when that defense is out, guys on offense, although they're, they're, you know, the coaches are talking to them, they're over there looking at watching those guys play because they want to watch them. They want to see Cardinal Mack play. They don't want to see these guys play because they're excited about it. When was the last time that happened? I'll tell you what I found amazing because you're a smart football player. You don't make it in the pros by just being physically gifted, folks. And you don't stick around if you're not smart. And I could usually, back in the day, and I know you too from growing up in Chicago, predict what every play was going to be on offense. I can no longer do that. I can no longer do that. <laughs> this guy, to me, is a hidden gem. I didn't like the hiring at first. I was fearing another Tressman type of situation. You know what happened last time? We had an offensive line. Plus, he was with the Chiefs, who hadn't bowled me over in the playoffs anyway. And, Chris, I don't know if you felt the way I did. I couldn't call a play. Every time I thought it was a run, he'd pass. Every time I thought it was going to be a pass, he'd do a, he'd do a pitch out. It was just, I, I think he had a strong, as strong a year as any rookie head coach could have. Absolutely, and he gets awarded for it. AP Coach of the Year, uh, Defense Coordinator, AP Assistant yeah, Coach of the Year. You know, the, the idea that if we sitting on our couches knew what the next play was, okay, so what are professional teams that are playing against them? What do they know? Right. You know, so the idea that we are now able to be unpredictable 
if something that hadn't happened to the Bears in how long? Years. Oh, my God. Well, here's the thing that I always used to, was fascinated me about Wanstead. I mean, he tried to call a truce with me and everything. I wouldn't stand for his nonsense because he was just, he's a good talker. God bless him. I'm glad he's got a good career for himself and stuff like that. But the thing that always mind boggled me is he didn't understand that you had to win the games in your division at the end of the day to have any kind of dominance. He treated the divisional games, even though you knew, Chris, from growing up, that Green Bay beating them was more important than beating the Atlanta Falcons. I mean, because they were in your division. So uh, that was the thing that I was always amazed at, the lack of awareness. And I think this coach has that awareness that a lot of coaches that I can count on 20 hands did not have, uh, except for a few. Well, I think finally in a long time, we were able to pace it. We were able to find a coach who not only understood the game, and how it's played, but understands the league, understands the conference, understands the division, and understands enough that if she takes a few plays off, if he decides not to play his starters in the fourth preseason game, he knows he's going to get a lot of crap for it, but he did it anyway. And that's something that I think takes balls, right? You're a first-year coach. You don't do this. You say, I'm going to do it my way. And then all of a sudden you have players who understand that and are willing to go the extra mile for someone who's willing to take chances with them. And, and that's important. So you find a coach like that, you are going to find people who are going to be excited about playing for him or her. And that's what I look for being an administrator, knowing that I need somebody who, who goes beyond the X's and O's. I know somebody, I need somebody who's willing to understand the game, but more importantly, understand the players and what they have to do to be motivated. Chris, it's great to talk to you, man. It's great that you came on. Love you like a brother. You know that. North side guy, south side guy. We did, we did some great things. We had a lot of fun. We, I still, I'm looking forward to coming down to Chicago state to say hello. And, uh, um, BB says hello. We all love you, and uh, Chicago loves you. I mean, you're part of Chicago Bear legend, buddy. Mike, you are always welcome. Obviously, at Chicago State, anytime you want to come, I will roll out our green carpet for you. <laughs> we have no problem with that. The idea that, awesome. that that you understand what it means to be a Chicago Bear fan is is is, is exciting. And knowing that we have a chance to kind of do some really good things now is extremely excited. So I hope I can come back on sometime, and I look forward to having the chance to hang out with you more. And please tell me I said hi. All right, Chris. Take care of yourself and your family, okay? All right, brother. Be good. All right, Chris Orch, yes. former Chicago Bear. Oh, my God, and here he is, Eldo Gandia. What's up, Eldo? I am telling you, that was a great interview and so great to hear I Chris forgot Orch. that I should have had you ask him a question. Darn it. Ah. I'm mad at myself. <laughs> that's I'm right. sorry. That's a, well, I'll let no, you that s- was the plan because we did that with Jimbo last week. That's right. Well, the, d- oh, I'm he, sorry, He brother. did promise to come back, so I will be happy to be well prepared and with questions. We had a couple of oh, questions. Oh, you from- were prepared anyway. You're a bit die, die hard bear. <laughs> Uh, what did what you? I thought that uh, he was straight up. Oh my god! Pretty, pretty knowledgeable. Sounds like a different guy to me. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, he was always just a great, great guy, and and, and he wears Chicago on his sleeve. Well, and I'll tell you, you know, I, I as soon as you told me uh, mid afternoon that he was coming on, I I started to refamiliarize myself with what he's been doing lately, and. One of the articles that I read that really impressed me was him talking about his philosophy over at Chicago State University, and he asked all of the players, what do we have to do to win a national championship? And they all raised their hands, and almost everyone to the man said, we have to go undefeated. And Chris corrected them and said, no, 
We have to have a great practice today. And what a great philosophy that is for all young men to, to learn. You don't, you don't look at the grand prize. You look at what, at what is ahead of you now in order to get to the next step. And it usually starts with those little things, having great practices, you know, getting ready for work that day, whatever it is. That was a great uh, example that he led, uh, that he shared with his young men. So he's a great guy, and I'm glad that uh, you got him on. Our listeners are really happy. To, to have listened to Chris Zorich and guess what? He promised to come back on so in a few months we'll hit him up again probably around the time that the, the Bears are collecting themselves for, for training camp. It would be great to have him back. Oh yeah, Chris will come on anytime just like Jimbo. Jimbo said he listened to last week's interview twice now. Ah, he said he nice. loved it. Uh, he says he, he just texted me today as a matter of fact and uh, and I think he wants to come on again, too, because he had a good time. Excellent. Awesome. Because these guys, let me, let me tell you something. It says here, Jimbo said, thanks again. Listen to the interview again. Awesome. You're the best, Jimbo. Awesome. And I said it was <laughs> great. Lots of response. You're the man. He says he'd like to come on again. So we'll get these guys again. We're not going anywhere. This is Bears Bar Room. That's we're right. Going, where do you think we're going? <laughs> it's Bears Bar Room. Right? Come on. We ain't and there's all sorts of stuff. Forget about the Bears. There's more hijinks going on more than ever. Uh-huh. I thought it was never. I said the Bears are over with. It was a great, great ride. You know what? There was no aggravation. Now there's nothing but. <laughs> now there's right. nothing but. <laughs> well, let's talk. Talk about what happened today. It was announced that the Cleveland Browns are signing uh, Kareem Hunt to a one-year contract. Now he's under, still under an uh, NFL investigation. We know the trouble that he has. The big story is about his uh, violent attack on a young woman. But there's also two other investigations that he apparently had uh, some altercations with with men on a couple of situations. So he's probably facing some type of disciplinary action, whether it's two games, four games, six games. Who knows what the NFL. They don't really have a, a set way of doing that, but you tweeted out as soon as you heard the news that you were disappointed because you thought that he would be a great member of the Chicago Bears. Tell us more about your thoughts on that topic. Well, I just think, uh, although that, that you know, all these people, I mean, I get a kick out of it. The same people that don't want him to play for the Bears are rooting for Anderson Russell to hit 300 this year with the Cubs. <laughs> so, right. um, you got to have a little consistency, number one. Number two, um, Look, we knew he's going to be suspended. He's not going to play. I mean, he's going to pay some sort of punishment. Mm-hmm. But once he clears that, like I said last week, guys like Greg Hardy got the play. Ray McDonald got the play. Uh, just just like assassins got the play. Is this guy a bad guy? A bad armbar? Absolutely. Do we, you know, there's no doubt about it. That there were, the, the, the video, he apologized again today for it. But if you're asking me, would I like him to be on uh, my football team? And do I think I'm going to have another problem with them? Dorsey doesn't think so. Dorsey knows him, but they kept him on a short leash. Mm-hmm. He's getting a chance because he's so multi-talented, and adding him to the Bears would have made them the odds-on favorite to win the NFC this year. Yep. I, I, well, you know, eh, that type of player. It's a shame when I make sense. I got, I got like a, a seventh grade education, but I sort of got you tongue tied. You did. <laughs> <laughs> that type He's of player. Good. Yeah, that type of player is such a perfect fit for Matt Nagy's offense, and you got to believe that if Matt Nagy gives the guy a call and wants to talk to him about how he's doing in his personal life, didn't want to talk football, that there, that that would have been a nice chemistry, and a guy like Kareem Hunt needs that kind of, for lack of a better way of putting it, a father figure. Uh, so you know, I, I while I usually you know have zero tolerance for situations like that, it would have been nice to at least to explore it, and maybe the. Bears did and decided it wasn't worth taking a chance. But Ray Lewis played. Yeah, he did. That's right. I don't want to hear about zero tolerance. <laughs> Ray Lewis he played, played the football in the National Football <laughs> League, and then we can go through on another hundred names. You have zero tolerance, and I'm sure, and I, I believe you. You're a man, mm-hmm. Eldo, of, of your word. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt. But when you're a decision maker in the National Football League, sometimes zero tolerance gets bent a little bit deciding on the talent and what it can do for a football team. I believe, and I, I would stake it, that, and I've been fooled before, 
but I think this guy will be a model citizen from here on in. I think he learned his lesson, and uh, I don't know if he's a Pac-Man Jones. Maybe he is. I always thought Pac-Man Jones was a guy that, you know, once you got in trouble a couple times, that he'd continue, and I was right up until last year, but I think this guy would make the Bears the odds-on favorite. I noticed you were a little bit hesitant, but you're willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, and why? Because he's the player that I think if he didn't go to Cleveland with Dorsey, would have come with the Bears and made us the odds-on favorite to win the Super Bowl. Yeah, I just think that it's very difficult for us people on the outside to make value judgments on this stuff without knowing all the facts. I mean, if we were to learn that Kareem Hunt has gone to, to anger management classes, that has been seeing a psychiatrist every week, that has been dealing with this issue of aggression towards others outside of the football field, then, then you have to give him a chance. But if you heard, heard that he had missed uh, appointments with his psychiatrist or whatever, I'm just making this stuff up. You know, then, mm-hmm. then you, 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 then you employ that zero tolerance. But I believe everybody deserves a second chance. But sometimes, you know, people ruin that second chance for themselves. So that's well. There's no doubt he hasn't even paid for the first chance. That's yet. right. <laughs> and he's already gotten a second chance. That's right. I mean, think about that. <laughs> you know, there's some people who never get a second chance. This guy's got the second chance, and he hasn't even paid for the first chance. All right, so we do- don't even know what's going to happen. But you know what? I don't care. If he was a member of the Bears, I'd be one of the guys that would be saying I'd be absolutely ecstatic. He's a game changer. And why did Kansas City lose this year? Yeah. At the end of the day, why did they end up losing? Because having him out of that lineup, having him out of that lineup, took away yeah. a lot of their options. Yeah, it, 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 that's definitely true. And they the still offense. scored a ton of points, right. but you had to run the football. Where was he? Yeah. He wasn't on your team. Right. It, they, their offense was definitely different after Kareem Hunt. And there's no doubt about that. No doubt about right. that at all. Now, we've got news that Eric Reed signs a three-year deal to return to the Carolina Panthers. He's a safety over there. That sets the threshold for Adrian Amos as to what he should be making. At, if, if Reed signs a three-year, $22 million contract with $10 million guaranteed, I have to believe that Amos has to be around that level probably a little less. What do you think? Do you think the Bears should put out a, a, about $20 million uh, over three years for Adrian Amos to safety? I First of all, I think you have a man crush on this guy. I'm not even <laughs> going to get into a debate with you on this. I could sense it on Twitter today. You're all over the place on this. Yeah, I, I thought I was reading the Inquirer uh, with Liz and Dick on the cover. Uh, you know, there's no doubt that you, uh, it, it, you must have dreamt you were his agent last night because there's no doubt I'm getting into it. I'm not getting into a debate with you about Adrian Amos because you, you're the one that's that, – that seems more passionate about him. I mean, if you if you ask me, Eddie Eddie Jackson or Adrian Amos, he's gone. Well, but it you, depends. You, you don't have that. You see what happens to football teams when they don't manage their money right. That's going to have to be one of the bear deals. Tell us about Adrian Amos. Go ahead. All right. Go ahead, my friend. Here, here's my my contention. Finally, for the first time in about ten years, we have a safety combination of Eddie Jackson and Adrian Amos that is probably in the top 10 of the league, and some people would argue maybe top five. I think mm-hmm. we should keep them together at least another two or three years. Sign them to a short-term short, ter- short term two- to three-year contract, and then when Eddie J- Jackson's contract is up, because he's probably going to d- demand almost twice the amount that Amos does, then you, you part ways with Amos if, if you're in a salary cap type deal, and you and by that by then hopefully you've got a young safety to step into Amos's role. But right now, the tandem of Eddie Jackson and Adrian Amos, you, all, you have to keep that together. I'm tired of having bad safety play in Chicago, and finally we corrected that problem. Let's not screw it up. I am sold. Okay. I am sold. I'm with you 100%. I like the short-term deal. I like the fact that it's not going to be terribly expensive. And he's part of a unit. Yes. And a good unit. So you got me there. There you go. All right. Man, Woo-hoo. you're on fire tonight. <laughs> Shoot off the flare. Let's go. My God. Now, I probably can't do the same about the Chicago Blackhawks, but you have to admit that their little winning streak here, seven games to get back into the playoff race, is pretty impressive. Although they're about as close to a playoff spot as they are to the end, to the bottom of the standing. So it's it's a bit iffy, but 
what do you think about these Blackhawks? Do you think they've got a chance to maybe surprise us and get into the playoffs? Well, I hope they get into the playoffs because they got to redeem what happened last year. It'd be nice if they got in and got out and got on the road. But if they don't, first of all, David Hall today said we owe the, the new coach an apology. And I, I tweeted David. I said, you know, what are you talking about? We weren't mad at him. Yeah, exactly. We weren't mad at him. We were mad at the Hawks for getting rid of Quinville after 15 games in a, a classless way for a three-time Stanley Cup champion. It has nothing to do with this guy. <laughs> but but don't tell me Quinville couldn't have won seven in a row. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll tell you we won three Stanley Cups, and you're going to look silly. Yeah. So so we weren't mad at him. It's sort of like Wanstead. I knew Wanstead was going to suck. I have no opinion of this kid. They look pretty damn good with the way they're playing now, but they still haven't made the playoffs. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to apologize to him. I wasn't mad at him, just like I wasn't mad at Wanstead. Mm-hmm. I was mad at the Bears for getting rid of Ditka. And, but but the way that they did it with Quenville is what I was upset about, and I think David understood that. Yes, I think that's a great point. I think when you fire a coach so early in the season, it means that you, you weren't prepared you know, why not fire a coach? I will never apologize to the Blackhawks for what they did to Joe Quenville, yeah. a three-time Stanley Cup champion. Yeah, that sucked. It really did. And, and I mean, you got to be kidding me, the way they treated him after 15 games like somebody else can't, like he couldn't have won seven in a row at the end of the season? Give me a break. Let's see, uh, Hart 4803. You think I'm getting a little bit too hostile? <laughs> no. I just got done watching Lawman on the Western Channel. <laughs> Remind me, which one Come was on. that? Lawman is with Chuck Connors? No, that was the Rifleman. No, that was the Rifleman. Yeah. Lawman spite this guy John Russell. Very robotic type actor. Check him out. Okay, I will they do They play that. a back-to-back on the Western Channel. I know what you're going to say. You got to start taking it easy, Mike. I know. I got. I got my Western Channel t- shows down, baby. <laughs> what else? Can, me. What else can we find on the Western Channel? Bonanza and Gunsmoke. I'm assuming. Oh, everything. Oh, nice. You know, Gunsmoke still sucks to me. I never was a Gunsmoke guy. I like Bonanza. I like the Rifleman. The Rifleman. My God. I know my buddy Bobby Sandless. We call him Ace. We grew up together. He watches the Rifleman every day. He knows the whole line, all the lines and everything. Holy cow. We've been watching them since we were kids. That's amazing. Now, unfortunately, there hasn't been a good Western on TV for, wow, 20 years or so, maybe more. I, uh, it's, as far as movies or on, on commercial uh, just TV? Just commercial TV, yeah. Oh, no, they don't, they don't do that no more. They don't have variety shows. Yeah, isn't that Where's, a shame? Come on. I mean, those were great shows. I mean, you got this you got to see the bands. Mm-hmm. I mean, Ed Sullivan had the Doors on. Yep. Had the Beatles on. Yep. Had the Stones on. Yep. Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. That was awesome. Yep. I yep. mean, we were kids and we're watching uh, Mick Jagger getting started. Yep. Very, very, very. I'm true. very, I'm very, I'm very pumped for some reason. I can't understand. Why. <laughs> Art forty eight oh three says that uh, Stan Bowman and John McDonough just gave nothing for Joe Quenwell to work with. They let him out hung uh, hung up in the wind. Let him out to dry, hung in the wind, whatever the expression is. And I, I have to agree with Hart forty eight oh three. Hart forty eight oh three. They just did a really j- poor job of player acquisition. And you know, I, I'm watching a game the other day. I'm, I'm like, who is that guy? Who is that guy? Who is that guy? It's like you they saw... got all the good players that he brought into a different team after he left. Yeah, talk about. Poor... But they look quick. They looked a lot. I'll yes, tell you what, Detroit did. Red Wings. Mm-hmm. Oh my God, are they slow yeah. compared to the Blackhawks? I watched the Blackhawks yesterday. Yeah, I saw that too. And uh, and they were quick. They mm-hmm. were they were a step quicker than the Red Wings. So uh, you know what? Hope springs eternal. Uh, I I don't like what happened. I thought they were going to win five and ten years. That's not going to happen. Detroit, for God's sake, when they were in their prime, they they for 20, 25 years. Mm-hmm. So, so, I, you know, the Blackhawks, uh, they made some bad moves. They got rid of Quenville. I think he could have done the same thing that they're doing now. But that's over with. I just am not going to apologize for, for the way they treated him. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm with you there. That was uh, uh, for an organization that has really <laughs> turned their reputation around uh, over the last uh, 10 years. That was oh, yeah. a Bush League move, move 
by by that public organization. relations nightmare that day. Yeah, really, really. That was a yeah. public relations nightmare. Having the new guy sit there with McDonough, Rocky Wurtz in the corner looking like uh, Herve Velichez <laughs> tattoo. You can barely see his head above the damn table, for God's sake. Right? I mean, my God, what happened to the guy that changed the black car culture? That's what Rocky Wurtz did. Yes. I like Rocky. I like Rocky. Yeah, he's but a But my guy. God, you're going to... You went, You did this by your gut. You hired McDonough. You went out and got all these people. And now you're listening to these guys tell you how the team should be? I don't know. Yeah. The young, Things change, I guess. The young Bowman guy, I just don't have much confidence in him. If you remember, it was Dale Talon that brought in the core of the Chicago uh, Blackhawks team. Patrick Kane. Dan Bowman's John- a member of the Lucky Sperm Club. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Give me a break. You got that that one. guy would be wait that guy would be working at the at the prime house as the mayor D if it wasn't for his dad. <laughs> break. How true is that? All right, Mike, anything else on your uh, board? We've been on for an hour now, so uh you want to close this baby up? We have? Yeah. Oh my god, well, I'll tell you what. Bryce Harper. Oh look, yes. look, let me just explain something to everybody <laughs> out there, okay? Uh-huh. If the guy had hit two ninety, you know, everybody that says the average doesn't matter anymore. Two fifty matters when you're when you're asking for thirty million bucks. <laughs> I don't give a damn how many times you walk, what you're on percentages. If you hit two fifty, okay, and you walked one hundred thirty times, then then basically you're a leadoff man. I know you hit thirty some home runs, but my God, yeah. the people that are crying. He turned down three hundred million bucks. Oh my God, period. <laughs> I love how people are saying it's the owners colluding. He turned down $300 million. How are you colluding? <laughs> yeah, right? Colluding to bankrupt the league, perhaps. <laughs> I pray to God, you know what, if the White Sox got him or Machado, I'd be happy because it's, it's a temporary Band-Aid. They're not going to win anything with you. And, I, you know, Bryce Harper's a talented guy, but he, but to me... You know what? He's not worth the aggravation. He's had trouble with athletes, with Scherzer, with with Matt Williams, other things. I just don't see it happening uh, as far as giving him that kind of money. 26-year-old kid turning down $300 million over 10 years. Can you believe it? <laughs> that just is so mind-boggling. I mean, how much? And, and, and people are going, well, they don't know. They think it was just for show. You don't put up three hundred million just for show. <laughs> yeah, really. You don't put up three. Who are, who are these ba- these baseball fans? I, I, I get on Twitter; it drives me nuts. I can't believe these people. <laughs> I mean, it's business. Three hundred million bucks. Somebody tells you where, and nobody's refuted that Washington didn't offer it to him. Yeah, he correct. turned down. Now maybe he don't like Washington, but but I'll tell you what, he had that offer. Juan Gonzalez, who was once a great player, turned down $85 million <laughs> from a team. He, he never got that money back. What's wrong with these guys? Yeah, exactly. They don't get that money back. You can't say no to a deal like that. But now they're saying the Giants, My God. the Giants and the Padres and the Phillies are the top teams in contention, maybe the Los Angeles Dodgers. You think he's going to go to any one of those teams, or you think there's going to be a surprise team coming in and making an offer to Harper? I'm, I'm telling you, man, I, I pray to God. Look, I have no axe to grind with the kid, but they, there was guys that were uh, 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 telling me he was going to last year he was going to get forty million a year. I go, you people are out of your minds, man. <laughs> what is Mike Trout worth if this guy's worth forty? Yeah, yeah that's I mean, a great guess. I mean, my God, I don't care if Mike Trout plays where nobody sees him and he doesn't do commercials. He's a baseball player. That's what he wants to be. If he, if if Bryce Harper gets. Thirty million. Mike Trout's got to get fifty million. I'm not kidding you. Yeah. He shows up every year in place. Bryce Harper. You don't know what guy you're going to get. Yeah. And Machado. All I heard people say he was a bum because he didn't hustle and he hurt, tried to hurt that guy at first base. Now, now only one team wants him. Guess who? The White Sox. <laughs> well, the Yankees. How many other people? How many people you hear say they want Machado? Well, the Yankees and the Padres are two teams that have been mentioned at almost as often as the White Sox, I would guess. So do you think there's a chance the White Sox are going to land Machado? I know you haven't spoken well of the guy in the past. <laughs> well, all I'm going to say is this, pal, is that Tulowitzki's on the Yankees. <laughs> and they seem to be happy with him, although he has been injury-prone. Yes. But, but Machado... 
He's gone down to a contract like Hayward's got. About $173, $180 million hmm. for seven years. That's not the money that he was looking for. Yeah. And and, and there's not a lot of teams looking for him. I, I, I'll tell you what, I like Tulowitzki if he stays healthy, but you can't depend on it. Machado, he can play third or short. I like how Tim Anderson of the White Sox even said, I don't feel like moving. Wait a minute. You're going to pick up Machado and you might not want to move from shortstop. So is Machado going to play third if the White Sox sign him? Who knows? Hmm. I didn't need to get my blood pressure up this high. <laughs> well, I'm glad you, you know, I, I really did. I'm glad I you, really did. Do you I th- mean, do we you haven't th- even gotten to the bulls yet, have we? <laughs> I mean, my God. <laughs> no, we it's haven't. like clown town. What can I tell you? Do you think, I mean, the whole thing. Do you it's think, been crazy. Do you think that the White Sox, as, as an organization, as a franchise, almost have to sign Manny Machado to keep fan interest? Because... You know, this team has been struggling the last few years, and, and they almost... Struggling? They... <laughs> That's like saying Lincoln struggled after he took a bullet to the temple. <laughs> My God. Struggled to get back to the floor. <laughs> My God. He looked up looking for the guard, and there was Booth. That's struggling. That okay? is struggling. <laughs> I mean, the White Sox are Lincoln right after the, the shot to the temple. I mean, no. I mean, I, they don't know what to do. I mean, seriously. <laughs> oh, what, what day is today? Today is Monday, February 11th, 2019. Guess what tomorrow is? <laughs> the 12th. Like, like it's birthday, isn't it? Oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I knew I'd work up in somehow. <laughs> Unbelievable. What can I tell you? I, you know, it, you know, I, I, that's what I do. I just, I just anger people. That's, that's, a, that's a gift. It's a gift. All right. You know, it, it absolutely is. All right. Oh, by the way, how did you like the new football league? Yes, we have to talk about this, right? The Alliance. I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. The guy got, listen, Brady would last a year. <laughs> he, they, ah, listen, right. all these guys that are going to play in the NFL because they, they're not allowed to be touched, Brady's going to be playing until he's 70 in the NFL. And here's this league. The other night I turned on the TV and the highlights, the guy's helmet flew off. No flag. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh. It was like, oh, unbelievable. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. Just finally. Somebody that gets it. If you would have had NFL uniforms on these guys, you couldn't have told the difference. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> but, oh, don't start. But it Listen. was entertaining. There, there's no doubt about that. It was entertaining. They had as higher ratings as Oklahoma City versus Houston. How about that for news? Wow. Now the, the Isn't trick, that great? Yeah. Now, the trick is, as you know, you've been in the business. It, will they keep those ratings up the second week? So will the fans come back? So that's the Probably big trick. Probably not, and then I'll start turning on them like I was like <laughs> But I was I was but reading up on this league, and, and you know their model is really based on a gambling model. They they have built an app where you can make in game bets. For instance, who's going to score the next touchdown? These proposition bets and so forth, and and that's what I they're building towards. Yeah, I think it's a really cool idea. I think it's a cool idea, almost as cool as Bears Bar Room. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> I, I really do. I, I love it. And, and you know what? It's been a lot of fun, Aldo. We've had a good time today, as always. Chris Orch, I thought, was great. Oh, my God. Um, what a great guy. You know, what? I just, he, he was up, I, I thought he was pretty straight up and stuff like that. So it was a good time, my friend. Hey, when, when you had that race with Chris Zorich. Down, Unbelievable. What, what street was that? Do you remember Laverne. the name? Laverne Street. Down Laverne Street. Belmont and Laverne, right by Foreman. I'll tell you what happened. Okay. Anyway, we're promoting the race for about a, about a month. Right. And I, I really, and when I say I used to run, we used to run, Chris knows what I'm talking about. We used to race for money mm-hmm. when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And, and I've raced people in, 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 in street shoes. I mean, back in the day. And stuff like that. Uh, right down Lincoln Avenue. There was a place called the Moulin Rouge. I won about 200 bucks from a guy. Uh, they had jello wrestling back in the day down there. <laughs> nice stuff. And, yeah, yeah, at and, and, and Lincoln Avenue. And some guy got, some guys were arguing about who was faster than who, and I ended up racing the guy right down Lincoln Avenue, right down the middle street about 1.30 in the morning. Mm. So, so I got on this thing with Chris about racing. And, uh... He said, well, I'll whip your ass. I mean, come on. I go, are you kidding me? 
<laughs> Are you kidding me? So we start talking. I got him on every every week, once a week on the radio. We promoted it. We had, uh, and I'll never forget it. It was like, there was like 800 people on this side street. It was unbelievable. 40-yard <laughs> dash. And he blew me away with the first three steps. <laughs> After about 30 yards, I was five yards behind him. But we're laughing. The, and, and, the, and, and, and you know what? Those are, and it, and it worked. It got the station plenty of publicity. Mm -hmm. There's no question. It was great for Chris. That Would that happen today? I don't know. Would, I, that, I would the Bears even allow that to happen? Oh, my gosh. That's a great point. No, uh, they wouldn't. They, they would not. They don't even want Tariq Cohen to do his backflips. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, I was racing Chris George on a, on a street with potholes who's in his prime in the National Football League. Oh, God. I mean, that would never happen now. No. But you know what? It was, it, I, that's what, I, all the athletes, Ronick and me, we, I mean, I did all that stuff with the athletes. It was a gas, and people loved it. When are they ever going to see a Chicago Bear race down a side street on the northwest side of Chicago? <laughs> Those people got that picture forever, and if you see it on Twitter, it's hilarious. Chris has got his tongue hanging out laughing at me, for God's sake. I think the last guy was Alonzo Spellman, but he was running away from the cops or something like that. Let me tell you something. Alonzo Spellman is the most menacing human being oh I've ever gosh. met in my life this is a guy that I considered a somewhat of an acquaintance, good acquaintance, or a friend. Uh, I didn't know. It. I, I, you just knew at some point he was going to snap, and he did finally. My yeah, God. I hope he's okay now because he seems like a nice guy, but my he God. He was a great guy. I love Alonzo, man. What a physical I specimen. That mean, that guy had eight. I, I, you know, maybe we'll get him on. Oh, that would be something. <laughs> yeah, but not in the same studio. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> I'll stay on the phone. <laughs> All right, Mike. All right, bud. I'll see you, baby. I'll see you everybody. The Bears Bar. Come right. on, everybody. Take care, everybody. Make sure you stick around for the Bears Hour Live Show with Draft Dr. Phil. This is all the time here for Mike North and Chris Zort saying goodbye.